Um, I wanted to uh, make a few comments, uh, give a little bit of background context about the newly announced discovery regarding the small void behind the chevrons of the Great Pyramid. I think uh, it's important to look a little bit beyond the headlines to understand the significance of this, the, the discovery, but also the significance of the announcement, what uh, what was actually being said and why was it being said. There's some, um, I think, some needed context uh, to put it all into perspective. Um, so that's why I wanted to record this uh, video. I hope it's not going to be too long. I'm going to try to keep this 30 minutes or so. So a um, um, couple of days ago, we heard from uh, antiquities in Egypt that uh, an endoscope was placed into uh, a space that connects to a void previously detected with muon technology uh, and this endoscope is now visualizing the space that you're looking at here um, and so I just wanted to um, discuss this a little bit especially the muon data actually that were published in Nature. This was a paper that was submitted uh, a while ago. So this, the data must have been uh, must have been uh, recorded and reported um, almost a year and a half ago. Uh, the paper was in review for quite a while. It's, I was a little surprised. It took more than a year for this paper to get accepted. And then it was published online uh, just a couple of days ago. So this is a, a, a large group of several organizations, uh, among them the Antiquities, there's uh, Dassault Systems, there's a Japanese university, Nagoya, that uh, provided one set of uh, detectors for these muons. There's a CEA from Paris. Um, so this is a big group. And what they did is to lay out detectors this time in the descending passage and also in Al Mamun's entry uh, to get a high resolution myography from this area here behind the chevron. So what you're looking at here is uh, from you're basically looking at the uh, the, uh, the the wall of the Great Pyramid from the inside. And these are the positions of these detectors, EM1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So these are two different ways to detect muons. The, the one in red, they use the, something that's similar to a photographic plate. And the one in yellow, they use the, the gas detection uh, device. And so here's a couple of images uh, of these of these detectors. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about this paper. It's very technical, obviously, but as usual, um, the, the main, the main idea is that, that, uh, that you're measuring these particles that are coming from, from space and they can make it through stone, uh, but they get attenuated. So some particles make it, some particles don't make it. If there is a open space, if there's a void, then more particles are able to make it through to the detector plate. And so you get a higher, stronger signal. And that stronger signal is telling you that there is a void. So it's a way to detect voids inside of a stony structure. It could be a built structure. It could also be a natural structure like a volcano, for example. So, um, and uh, so to cut to the chase, so this is the signal itself. This is uh, this is the actual muon flux. Uh, now, what they have to do now is they have to they have to simulate what the signal would look like if there were no void, and then they take the actual signal that they receive and compare that to the simulation. And anything and above and beyond what's expected in the simulation is then uh, a true signal. So that's kind of the the rationale behind myography. And as you can see, when you look at the ratio of data to simulation, you do get a signal here for this uh, particular area. 
They also saw a little bit of a shouldering effect on each side of the signal, as you can see here. Um, and they were wondering if maybe there could be a void or there could be substructures or sub voids next to what they were detecting. Um, so I'm just gonna go over this uh, briefly. The details are not, I don't think that important. Um, there's some kind of, kind of a, some few interesting things. So this, the scan was longer this time than in the past. They uh, added the muon signal from several periods that they, observation periods. And it's also kind of interesting how many muons actually they're detecting. So it runs in the order of millions. So between 10 million, 100 million uh, muons is what they are detecting. And what they are looking at is the angle at which the muon is entering the detector plate. Based on that angle, you can then do directional analysis and uh, and uh, pin the location of the voids in a three-dimensional space. Uh, turns out uh, that there's a, there's a fairly good correspondence in this case uh, between the two methods they used. And most importantly, they were able to uh, determine the dimensions of the void with good accuracy. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the detectors were close to uh, what they were trying to measure. Uh, now, there is something here that uh, is worth remembering for what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, and it has to do with what uh, Zahir Waz is predicting, that he thinks there's something going to be under this this void. So this is called the void is called the NFC. Uh, DC stands for Descending Corridor. And Zahir Waz thinks that he might find a burial chamber underneath the structure because he thinks it's a supporting structure that's protecting something underneath. But uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, show you the raw data um, so you can judge for yourself. It doesn't look like there's anything between this, uh, this small void and the descending passage. There's no signal here. You can see that on these scans. Uh, EM56, these are still the Nagoya uh, detectors. So this is the photographic like plate. But even if you look at with the uh, the data from the other type of detector, uh, it's just a little bit further down. Uh, I think that was maybe in figure eight or something like that. Can't remember right now, but... Uh, yeah, it with neither technology with ne neither technique did they find uh, something in between in between these two voids. So it kind of argues against what Hawass is thinking, what the function of this space might be. Um, but I wanted to um, explain. So this is one thing that most people may not know is where Hawass actually got this idea. Well, this idea actually comes from the Pyramid of My Doom. And so um, I just wanted to introduce uh, a, uh, a French arch uh, architect who went into the Pyramid of My Doom. Uh, it's about a couple of hours south of Giza, uh, together with, um, uh, I think it's a real estate broker, actually, Jean-Yves uh, Verdehert. So Gilles Dormion is an architect from France. Um, and what they did is uh, they were able to find a very similar structure, a protective structure, that's the interpretation anyways, above a corridor in the Maidum Pyramid. And so what I'm showing you here is a great uh, guide to the Maidum Pyramid. This is written by uh, Keith Hamilton, who uh, has a whole, his, a whole series of these, um, of these guides, uh, layman's guides to various uh, Egyptian pyramids. And so this one was published a few years ago, that was one of his first one. It may have been the first one on the Maidun Pyramid. Um, and Keith always does a fantastic job to uh, illustrate the architecture um, and how was how was how was it how it was engineered. Sorry, um, and so particularly, uh, he uses uh, graphic reconstruction and. So I just wanted to show this to you that Guillaume uh, Dormion is actually the, the one who found 
this void above the uh, the horizontal corridor, this was only something like 24 years ago. Uh, when I was in the Maidun Pyramid, uh, let me see if I can show you the picture. So I, this is the horizontal, I'm blocking out the guide, so I don't want to show his picture without his uh, consent. Um, but uh, anyway, so we're walking through the pyramid and now the entry is is there. And as you're entering this portion of the corridor, when you look above on the ceiling, you can see the area where Dormion suspected that there must be something above. And uh, strangely enough, this was missed by previous uh, investigators, archeologists, and uh, Keith also makes a point of this, that this is rather stunning that this was missed. But so it was uh, Gilles Dormion, who's the first one, who decided to put a, a scope into, this, uh, into that weak spot, uh, which turned out to be just kind of a walled off hole. And he is the one who found these uh, core belt voids above this uh, horizontal passage here. Um, and again, this is uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, they were subsequently prohibited from any further analysis uh, when they went to the Khufu Pyramid or the Great Pyramid. So Dormion is the one who then uh, also did analysis uh, in the Great Pyramid, and he is the one who proposed that there may be something under the Queen Chamber. Uh, and so you should uh, you should read this article. This is it, it's interesting, um, and also how uh, how initially Dormion was kind of shut down. So here's, for example, a comment by Aiden Dotson, is a prominent Egyptologist, and he's saying the idea that Khufu's burial chamber is still to be found in the pyramid I find unbelievable. Uh, and 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 this is coming from an expert in funerary archaeology archaeology at the University of Bristol. I've actually met Aiden Dotson. He was in California giving a talk a few years ago. Um, but this is sort of the reaction that Dormio was getting. And now fast forward a couple of decades, and now Zaya Was himself is talking about the hidden burial chamber of Khufu. Um, but the more uh the more important takeaway from this is that it was really Dormion who was the first one to uh, uh, to discover the fact that pyramids had protective voids above corridors. So this comes from Dormion's discovery and it comes from the Pyramid of Maidum. Uh, so this is the first takeaway from uh, today's talk that I wanted to uh, impart. So, and now we can go to Hawass. I don't know if you can hear the sound. With this uh, but, shadow ceiling, so the here's main reason from my point of view, Mustafa Waziri, to relieve the weight of something, to distribute the weight or the pressure on something. If we say that this tunnel is protecting or is holding a stone above something, we cannot say it's a corridor at all. There is no way there is a corridor will be here. Because down seven meters, there is another corridor. Between the seven meters and, and the tunnel that we found today, there is something important. So this is what they're saying. Um, but just uh, wanted to reiterate again, not only is there no evidence based on the scan, like I was just showing you here, that there's anything under this new void? Uh, the other, the other uh, problem with Hawass's and Waziri's comments is that what they're saying is there's nothing that this is a dead end corridor and there's nothing, nothing behind it. But uh, if you read this paper carefully, uh, it is that they cannot completely exclude the possibility of uh, a connecting. Uh, a connecting corridor to uh, to another place, for example, the Great Void, um, because of the detection limit. So it turns out, let me see if I can find this here, but the detection limit is a meter. Uh, anything above a meter, the muon uh, scanning can detect, but if it's less than a meter, they cannot. So what that means is that there's no way for Hawass to know, at this point anyways, uh, whether there might not be a continuation of the small void 
going either horizontal or vertical up to the big void. Um, but so this it's his his idea that there's something under the small void is based on two assumptions that he's making. So the first assumption is that uh, I'm sorry, I'm clicking randomly. I just wanted to. So the first assumption he's making that this is a dead end, and therefore this is not a corridor, so to speak, but a relieving chamber. Uh, that idea, like I was just explaining, originally comes from, not from Zaya Was, but it comes from Gilles Dormion, who discovered just such a thing in the Maidum Pyramid. And um, and uh, and so Hawass thinks that this is a, uh, a relieving chamber, and that means it's relieving pressure from something that's underneath. Um, but we don't have any evidence based on muography that that exists. And in addition to that, Hawass could be wrong. Uh, and the corridor actually does continue. And it's just that the muon signal doesn't detect it. Um, let me just get back to this real quick. I'm sorry, I'm clicking around, but this is just sort of a an ad hoc presentation. Um, so here, this is what I was talking about. Let me get you the, the right. So here, um, so if that's the outside, that's, that's, I'm sorry, this is the outside. This is the uh, descending passage here, and this is the void. Uh, this signal is just not resolved enough to be able to detect uh, anything that goes uh, from it past the the wall. The other comment that, about this I wanted to make is that it was really um, Filippo Biondi and Corrado Malanga that just published uh, a paper that beat the muon people to the punch, so to speak, they published this paper uh, in uh, in October, and they are detecting the very same small void among other voids, uh, and they call these tags. So let me just get to the table first of all, and show you. Uh, this is a paper I discussed in the previous video on my channel. Uh, here is the table where they show all the new structures they found. And here on number seven, they call this the little void. And if you go to their, um, if you go to their 3D reconstruction, then there are several views where you can see this number 17 tag. So, uh, and there's one particular image I wanted to show you. So here's the different, let me see, tag 17.5, uh, tag 9, tag 20, 15. Now it's a lot of data, so it's sometimes not so easy to find it. But here's 17, yeah. So this is, uh, here's the Grand Gallery. There's the ascending passage, descending passage, or entry corridor. Here's approximately where the chevrons are. And as you can see, TAC-17, that is where Biondi and Malanga also detect the signal. So that corresponds to the muon signal. Uh, but as you can see, the signal extends across in the direction of the queen chamber. Uh, this is something also that... Uh, my friend Jean-Paul Bouval has predicted for many years, he thinks that there was originally a horizontal entry directly going to the Queen Chamber. There's probably other researchers that may have also thought about this. Um, but um, if you look at uh, here, for example, uh, let me see if you wanted to show you. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. So here, for example, there, beyond the Malanga in figure 58, they uh, clearly show that they believe that there is a void that continues on, maybe not to the big void, but there is a canal that connects all the way across. So with their technology, their belief that they see something here, and this would be small enough that it would fall under the detection of the myography. Um, and at the same time, they did not see anything between the small void and the descending passage. So, so that uh, rules out, um, at least with this type of method, what Hawass is saying.
The other thing I wanted to point out uh, is that when Hawass said that he doesn't uh, trust radar or he doesn't like radar, I think he made some kind of comment like that in the last few days. I think that was a swipe at uh, the the two Italian researchers here because that is what they're using. They're using uh, uh, radar images um, and they have quite impressive results. Uh, and to my reading, this is a higher resolution than the myography. And um, and of course, this these data have not been acknowledged yet by, as far as I know, by antiquity, antiquities. I don't think Hawass has even commented on this. Um, I think they were kind of forced to make an announcement because uh, this uh, radar image imagery has uh, taken sort of the the wind out of the sails. They they basically came out with this before the Muon team uh, was able to publish their data. So I think uh, this paper had a little bit to do with the fact that we were even treated to uh, a publicly announced uh, new discovery. Uh, so they they sort of had to come out with something. Uh, but at the end of the day, I my prediction is that Hawass is going to be uh, wrong about something being under here. I mean, I could be wrong, obviously. Maybe he knows something. We already done something that we don't know about. But uh, based on the radar data, I think there is a continuation and the muon uh, experiment just missed it because it's too small. Um, so that is that is what I wanted to say about this uh, new void. Um, uh, now I wanted to also just break a break a few few brief comments about um, you know how I said he um, he doesn't hold back data and he wants to come out and but but he's been you know it's kind of frustrating for uh observers both on the egyptology side alternative historians uh that you don't hear much out of egypt um when it, especially when it comes to the great pyramid the sphinx and this this rumor going around that there's more known than is being let on and so we're getting sort of piecemeal information and i just wanted to put this a little bit in perspective i'm definitely not excusing it i'm uh, just explaining it that it probably has to do with money and politics and just i just want to make a few comments about that if you look at uh, if you look at the egyptian uh, gdp uh, it has actually grown it has recovered from uh, pandemic times there was a slump in 2017 gdp has recovered uh, but the the tourists um this is uh these are tourist visitors so it's kind of slumping um you know 2020 this is it it because of the pandemic tourist numbers have dropped but uh, and also the portion of total gdp of tourism is uh has gone down over the years um so in response to that uh if you look at uh um so here's here's the number of tourist arrivals so it's kind of flat i mean uh, the best year in the last few in the last, uh, let's say, 12 years was in 2010, almost 15 million tourists. But since then, it was sort of flat. So Egypt, every once in a while, they need to make an announcement, bring out something exciting like the Grand Egyptian Museum, like some news about mummies, uh, about famous mummies that are still being searched for, like Cleopatra, Nefertiti, etc. Um, and if so that is kind of like you... If you put that in, if you put announcements into this economic context, then it does make sense why we only get piecemeal. It has to do with how well tourism is doing. Um, also, the other thing which is important to know is that the Egyptian pound is going going down. Um, it's been devalued uh, just recently, uh, last year. It's a fairly significant drop from approximately something like 18 to one and now it's more like uh, uh more like 30 to one um so so the egyptian money is devaluing it makes it easier for foreign noise to come to egypt and buy goods and services and so uh all of this is adding up to egypt needing more tourists to come to the country and if you understand that that there's a con is there's a lot of economics behind it I mean, tourism is if it's ten, if it's ten percent 
of GDP, we're talking about 30, 40 billion dollars. And if you multiply that by uh, you know the uh, the spending that happens when tourists leave money in Egypt and then that money trickles down to the vendors, to restaurants, hotels, and then they spend that money. So it multiplies and the income multiplies. And so it has a significant effect on the economy. Um, and so when Zaya Was makes an announcement, it it directly translates into dollars for Egypt. Um, and so if you understand that, then you understand why this is not just about the purity of science, but it has to do uh, to a significant degree with uh, money for Egypt and with politics and why the Egyptian government wants to preserve its right to make scientific announcements. Um, I mean, imagine a paper like this, how many people are going to read this paper and will go to Egypt based on a paper like this. And so if you compare this to uh, the, uh, the most famous archeologists from Egypt uh, standing in front of all these microphones and making announcements, then uh, there's no comparison whatsoever. So it explains everything. It has that this is about Egypt needing tourists to come to the country. Um, but anyways, I think uh, it's good to know this kind of context. Uh, it, it helps you not to be as upset when you don't get all the information that you think should be released. Uh, and I think it's always important to remember who actually, uh, on whose shoulders you're standing. And some of that gets often filtered out in Egyptology. Um, but I think it's good to set the record straight and remind people that there were other researchers that uh, that made the original discoveries based on which some of these models are then formulated. Uh, and I, I am convinced that what Zahi Awas is proposing has a lot to do with what Gilles Dormion discovered, uh, um, you know, something like a quarter century before. Anyways, that's it uh, for today. Um, more videos coming, but um, it's an excitement I can you can feel the excitement about this small void, but uh, I think uh, there's more to come, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we hear more. But it's always going to trickle down. We're not going to get the whole story all in one package.